you very much. And thank you all for the opportunity to, to speak to you. Um, it's a great privilege to be here as both Andrew and myself were Mossman residents at one time. I lived in Belmont, Belmont Road for about 10 years, uh, quite some years ago. Uh, first of all, I'll just explain a little bit about our society. We're the oldest uh, continuously running society of its type in the world. There are two others rather like us. There's Cross and Cockade in the United Kingdom and Over the Front in the United States. But uh, we run a bit, we've been running continuously longer than they have. Uh, we do a number of things. We meet four times a year at Victoria Barracks um, to discuss items of interest and uh, how we have contests and discussions and things. The, the jewel in our crown is our journal that we put out annually. So we're moving to two journals a year from, uh, from this year. And I'll just pass around a couple of journals if you can have a look and I'll give you an idea of the sort of thing that we, we put out. Uh, we also, last year was that being our 50th anniversary, we put out a CD with an article from every one of our journals over 50 years. And um, if you cross my palm with money, uh, you can have one of those for only $5. Uh, the other things we have, we have a website, and we're very proud of our website, thanks to the efforts of Andrew. Um, it has a database on it of every Australian that we can identify who served in an air service during the Great War. Uh, there's about 5,600 and something names in it. Um, and they're not only the men who served in the Australian Flying Corps, but the Royal Flying Corps, the Royal Naval Air Service, the Royal Air Force, and two who served in the German Luftschutzkraft. Um, and we, we know of two who died, well, two who were born in Australia who served, who died while serving with the Germans. Um, there may be more, we're still, still looking. Uh, also on the, the database we have uh, Every one of our journals for the last 50 years are available to download to members. We have an extensive photograph library and we're building a library of uh, combat reports. The reports filled in by pilots after an action and uh, these are invaluable to historians. Right, that's, that's what we do. And we'll move on to the talk. And I apologise for the photograph quality in some of these. They're, um, they're, they're old photographs. Um, I'm attempting to cover probably the most dynamic four years of aeronautical development in about an hour. So uh, there'll be quite a bit that will be left out. So if you're rather hoping for an in-depth discussion on the um, uh, Russians and, and Austrians on the Eastern Front, I'm afraid you're out of luck. 1903, the Wright brothers flew, um, as, as we all know. The, uh, that was because it took them about five years to actually convince people that they had to carry out this marvelous fleet of flying heavier than air machine. And about uh, 1908, the US government showed some interest in, from a military perspective. And so uh, there you see a, a, a right flyer and a US Army lieutenant with a, um, a Lewis gun. But um, around the world, there, there still wasn't much interest. They couldn't really see much sort of uh, potential for military use of aeroplanes. And then uh, 1909, Blaria flew the English Channel. And the penny dropped that uh, people could fly above barriers like channels and rivers and uh, seas and things. And uh, there was a, really a need to have something like an air arm. There was a military purpose to it. You could see a lot from up in the air. So in 1912, the British formed the Royal Flying Corps. And this was a, a, a joint Army-Navy organisation. And... Um, the idea was to, to encourage aeronautical development, train pilots, and learn what they could do in wartime. The, the Navy, however, split away in 1914 and formed the Royal Naval Air Service. But most of the aeroplanes at the time were civilian aircraft that had been impressed or just uh, bought by the Army. However, Britain also established the Royal Aircraft Factory, uh, which was to, to build aeroplanes specifically for military purposes. And this is the B-2. This is a design by... Um, Geoffrey de Havilland, who went on to bigger and better things later on. But in 1913, that was considered about a state-of-the-art military aeroplane. A few curious things from our point of view is the, uh, the observer is in the front cockpit and the pilot in the rear. The observer's in the front because the idea was that uh, he could see over the leading edge of the lower wing, he could see what was down there. Uh, he had a, a big cockpit so he could have notes and fold maps and so forth and the pilot would take him where he wanted to go. 
that uh, this, this led to some problems later on, as we'll see. 1914, the Royal Flying Corps moved to France when uh, the British Expeditionary Force went across in August 1914. This is actually a drawing of the very first Royal Flying Corps patrol going out looking for the, the German army that was then bearing down on the, the BEF, British Expeditionary Force. One of the, the problems they first found was um, how to identify aeroplanes. Do I have ground troops? Can I identify aeroplanes? Um, there was a tendency to, by ground troops, to shoot at all aeroplanes on the grounds that whatever they, whoever they were, they weren't doing them any good. So the Germans painted an iron cross on their aeroplanes, and the British painted a Union Jack. You see a B2 that's overturned, and as you'll see, that the most distinctive feature of the marking is the cross. Um, so the Union Jack wasn't such a good idea, and was, was soon dispensed with, and they followed French practice in putting a roundel, but a red, white, blue roundel, but they reversed the, the colours to distinguish from the French. The uh, aeroplanes played a very vital part in the Battle of the Marne, which was one of the turning points of 1914, and because the Air Royal Flying Corps observers discovered a, a break in the German line uh, that led to the French and British advancing and uh, turning the, the German flank. And that, this led to the what was called the race to the sea, or an, an attempt to outflank each other. Both, both, both armies, Allied and, and German, uh, trying to head north, trying to outflank. This eventually led to the trench lines. If you can imagine a continuous line of trenches running from uh, the North Sea to the Swiss frontier, which is about the same as uh, trenches running from here to about somewhere between Kobar and Wilcannia. And the only people who could cross the trench lines and come back again were the flyers. And here we see a, a Royal Flying Corps BE2C uh, flying above no man's land with the trenches <coughs> fairly, uh, fairly distinctive. But rather than, than just to rely on notes, it was obviously a good idea to take photographs this led to a, um, a whole science of, of aerial photography and photographic interpretation. The other thing that uh, aeroplanes did fairly soon was start uh, artillery spotting. And th uh, explain, this is a very important thing that right through the war, one of the major functions for aeroplanes was to spot for the artillery. What had happened was an aeroplane would fly in a figure of eight between the artillery battery on the ground and the target uh, at the top and would signal the fall of shot to the, to the gunners to correct their aim until they were hitting the target. Uh, they started off with the observer doing this, but it was soon discovered that the observer really couldn't observe because when the, when the shell landed, invariably the aeroplane would be turning or there'd be a strut in the way or a wing in the way or something. The only person who could keep the target in, uh, in sight was the pilot. So the, the task of observing went to the pilot and the observer was there to look for, for other things, such as enemy aeroplanes. Um, they also found it was difficult, this is pre the days of radios, it was difficult to signal from the aeroplane to the gun battery. They tried um, flashing lights that didn't work, flares didn't work, uh, and eventually a small wireless transmitter was fitted on the aeroplane. Um, and initially, they, they tried saying things like uh, 200 yards north, northeast. No, that didn't work. That was too long. So they developed the clock code. You can see there. So you can simply say, shell landed A6, and that would give the, the gunners a, a, an indication of where the thing landed. So that was, that was good. That, that worked pretty well. The aeroplanes weren't the only observers in the sky. There were also observation balloons. Uh, and they were allocated about one per division along the front. Uh, they'd be up a couple of thousand feet in their basket hanging underneath with an observer. And uh, they would be there all day observing to see what was happening in the enemy rear area. Uh, they were a, a very difficult target to hit because they were surrounded by anti-aircraft guns, although they were full of, of hydrogen. Uh, some pilots used to, to specialise in bringing them down. They were called balloon busters. But it was a very difficult and very uh, uh, a very hazardous target. Right, there's a, a kite balloon in the air and you can see a little basket underneath with the observer. Um, one of the, a phrase that, I think it's just about dropped out of English now, but there uh, used to be a phrase, when the balloon goes up, meaning when something was about to start. And this comes from the practice of 
when there was an offensive, there'd be more, more divisions in an area and hence more kite balloons. Kite balloon observers had one uh, great advantage over pilots, or of air the pilots and observers, they had a parachute. Until 1918, no uh, aeroplane people had parachutes. Then the Germans and the Austrians started equipping their, their airmen with parachutes. But uh, balloon observers had them. Uh, so when the balloon was attacked, they could at least jump out. There, um, there was a theory by some, some pilots that it was all right to shoot a balloon observer when he was descending by parachute on the grounds that um, if, as soon as he hit the ground, give him another balloon, he'd be back up there and uh, carrying out his function again. Um, I don't know that too many balloon observers would have subscribed to this theory, but uh, yeah, some, some pilots felt once he jumped, he was safe, others didn't. Okay, we moved on to um, defences against aeroplanes. Uh, this is the light one, anti-aircraft machine guns. This would, uh, was obviously good against low-flying aeroplanes. And then anti-artillery, anti-aircraft artillery. This is a British 13-pounder um, in Italy to, for aeroplanes that were flying a bit higher. The whole thing of uh, flying on the Western Front was a, like a pendulum that swung from one side to the other. As one side would, would have um, aerial superiority and be able to carry out their functions um, pretty much unheeded while they had the best, better aeroplanes. And then the other side would develop something better and we'll go back the other way. The standard British aeroplane for 1915-1916 was the BE-2C, which was an improved version of the BE-2 that we saw earlier. It still had, it was a bit faster, um, but it wasn't manoeuvrable. It was designed to be stable so that the observer could have a good look at what was happening. It still had the observer in the front cockpit, which meant if it was attacked, um, was very difficult to, to fight from. The observer had the machine gun, but uh, he had a forest of struts and wires and propeller in front of him. It was realised that um, if you were going to fight with an aeroplane, the best thing to do was to be able to fire straight ahead. And uh, a Frenchman, Roland Garros, after whom the, pet st the tennis stadium is named, um, had a marine, sol a marine sonia parasol. Not this, this was a captured one here but it's the best photograph of a comet. And he fitted a machine gun to it to fire through the propeller. And the way it worked was he bolted steel plates to the propeller, you can see them there. And if a machine gun round hit the, the propeller, it would be deflected off to right or left. Uh, very primitive, but it worked. Uh, probably didn't do the propeller any good. But he brought down four uh, enemy aeroplanes before he was uh, forced down by, by engine trouble. The Germans had a look didn't terribly like what they saw, and uh, developed a, a means of a timing to it so that they could actually fire efficiently through the, the propeller. And this led to the Fokker Eindecker, which was a, not a terribly good aeroplane, but it had a, a, a synchronised forward firing gun, and uh, it could shoot out anything in the sky. And the British pilots started referring themselves to themselves as Fokker fighter. There were a number of... of uh, attempts to um, overcome this problem of firing through the propeller. One was the BE-9, which is an adaptation of the BE-2, and you can see the observer has a little cockpit in front of the propeller. Uh, this was not terribly popular, for fairly obvious reasons, um, especially on the muddy fields of the Western Front, where nosing over on landing was, was common. But only one uh, BE-9 saw it, did a, a combat flight, and I read the report of the pilot, and he said that the one thing that terrified him was the thought that they might actually encounter a German aeroplane and shoot it down, because then these things would be ordered into production. Um, <laughs> it wasn't. <laughs> the French did pretty much the same thing. That's a SPAD A2, and again with the, the, the gunner in front. The, uh, the French air service had a good look at it and said, no, thank you. And uh, they were sold to the Russians, who were grateful for anything that could, could fly. And in fact, some of them were still flying as late as the Russian Civil War in 1920. Something that still had to be done, as you can see, that's about the best a BE-2 observer could do, is fire backwards over the pilot's head. To fire, fire any other way, he had, had problems with his aeroplane or rigging or something. There are other attempts. Uh, some BE-2s were fitted with a Lewis gun that fired at 15 degrees from the angle of flight. And if you think for a moment how difficult it would be to aim 15 degrees off from where you're flying at a moving target, um, it wasn't a great success. 
But some, it did, they did bring down some enemy aeroplanes. That's a, a, a de Havilland too. And um, you can see it's got a Lewis gun at the front, uh, and the pilot sits behind it, and you can aim the aeroplane and the gun at the same time. Uh, it was a, a way around the problem. Um, it was a good aeroplane for the time, it, it certainly beat the, the Fokker Eindecker. One of its, its defects was it was a very cold aeroplane. In fact, I've written an account of a, a pilot who was forced to land, or crash actually, because he was so cold that he couldn't, couldn't um, manipulate the controls. <clears throat> because all the heat from the engine is behind him. And you can imagine you're flying at um, altitude in an open cockpit over northern France, uh, not warm. The, the, another great British pusher is the, B, is the FE2, FE2B. This is one actually built in New Zealand by one of our, our members, Sir Peter Jackson. And um, it's a, a, yeah, a two-seater. You've got a, a Lewis gun for the uh, observer in the front, and there's also another Lewis gun behind him that he can fire backwards, that he, he can stand up. Um, the pilot sits behind him. A very good machine, it did a lot of, of good work, and in 1918 it became a, a night bomber. And there's, that'll give you an illustration of what it was like to fire the, um, the rear uh, machine gun. Now remember these men were flying in combat, uh, wearing a heavy leather coat, um, standing just on the, the edge of their cockpit with no safety belt, while the, the pilot's taking evasive action. Um, yes. Uh, no, not many. What was the life expectancy? In, t in weeks? Uh, it, no. The life expectancy of an RFC pilot in, well, we'll get to it. In the worst time was April 1917, which we'll get to. And when they were sending pilots out to France, it was sometimes like 10 hours, and not, some of them were dead before they'd unpacked. Um, it depends. If you, if, you were late, if you could survive the first two weeks, they say you could survive for six weeks, and if you could fight for six weeks, um, you might last longer. The French then went to another thing. They put, developed a Newport fighter, and you can see that's got a Lewis gun above the wing, so it can fire above the propeller. The problem with that is um, uh, at altitude, you had to pull down the Lewis gun to change drums. The Lewis gun has a, a drum of 97 rounds, the, the, the Army Lewis gun had put, no, 47 rounds, the Air Force one, the Air, uh, Air one, 97 rounds. But pulling that down at altitude, in, uh, when the oxygen's a bit thin, uh, was quite a chore. So you had, had your 97 rounds, you could reload, but it wasn't an easy task. Uh, yeah, well, fixing a jam is another problem too. The, uh, the next step was, the British developed this very good machine, the stuff with one and a half struts. That had a synchronised forward gun, the observer had a Lewis gun at the back on that, that new shaped ring. Um, it was a tremendous aeroplane for its day. It had all sorts of things. It had air brakes, the first aeroplane with air brakes. It had a variable incidence tail that could be bolted in flight. Um, it was produced as a bomber and a fighter. It was a single seat a bomber version. Um, massively produced in France <coughs> under license. Quite a machine. Unfortunately, the Germans <coughs> produced something even better. D2, uh, D, yeah, D, D2. Um, twin forward firing guns, a bit faster than anything the British had, um, and made life rather difficult. And so the, the, the ascendancy that the DH2s it had was gone. Uh, the, the Germans also produced an attractive two seaters, it's a Roland C2, and that's got a, a forward firing gun and a gun for the observer. It was fast and, and difficult to bring down. The, uh, the French developed the, then the, the Newport 17, which you can see has got a synchronised Lewis uh, Vickers gun to fire through the propeller and a, a, a Lewis gun above. And so that was that was a standard Allied fighter for early 1917. And there's a very rare coloured photograph of a, a Newport taken in 1917. And that's uh, a drawing of, of Newports, in this case Royal Naval Air Service, uh, in action. The British, next British fighter was the, the Sopwith Pup, which was apparently a delightful aeroplane. Flew very well, but uh, a little bit underpowered, and it only had one forward firing gun, which um, meant it was it, it could match it with the Albatross D2s, but it didn't have the, the weight of fire that they had. So there were, there were disadvantages, but it was a, a very good machine. The French developed the, uh, the Spad 7, 
That was a, a, another great machine. Tinker pull the firing gun, manoeuvrable, tough, and uh, used by just about every Allied nation. The, um, you can see the, the, the scarf of the pilot. The pilots in, in the First World War generally wore a silk scarf because they were continually turning their heads and so that their jacket would, would, would wear on their, their throat. The, uh, the next disaster to come from the Royal Aircraft Factory was the B2E. This is a, a cleaned up version of the B2C, uh, but unfortunately the observer was still in the front seat, so it was still very hard to fight from. And um, they were sent to France and they were shot down in droves. In fact, um, the Brit Germans brought out the Albatross D3, which is an improved version, a faster version of the, the D2. And April 1917 was when the, the D3s were at their best, and it was known to the Royal Flying Corps as Bloody April. Um, the losses were horrendous. Squadrons were losing almost their whole complement. Um, it was really grim. Made worse because the army was attacking during the Bar Battle of Arras, so they had to maintain a, an aerial presence over the battlefield. But things improved about the same time. The British SE-5A, this is an um, improved version of an aeroplane called the SE-5, this came out in, the first ones hit the, the front in July 1917. Got a Vickers and a Lewis gun, um, a good stable gun platform, it was fast, it was stable. They um, performed well at altitude and remained in service till the armistice. And many of the uh, British aces flew SE 5As. Also, the Bristol Fighter, which is a two seater that handled like a single seater, one forward firing gun, and, and um, a gun for the observer as well. Um, they were one of the classic machines, they stayed in Royal Air Force service until the 19, late 1920s. The DH-4 was a, a bomber. Uh, it was fast enough to outrun just about any German fighter. Um, good, good payload. Two disadvantages. One, there was a fuel tank between the pilot and the observer, so they couldn't communicate in flight. And the second, it used a Rolls-Royce engine, and they needed Rolls-Royce engines for other things. But, well, but it was a, a superb machine. There was the RE-8. It was, it was finally replacing the B-2. The RE-8 was an ungainly looking machine, but it could handle itself, it could be handled well, <coughs> did a good job. And one thing you might like, the, the one Mossman man who was killed uh, while in the Royal Flying Corps was training on an RE-8 at the time. But that, that became the standard artillery observation machine of the war. The Germans kept developing and they tried to improve the, the Albatross D3 into the Albatross D5 and D5A. Uh, and this, if nothing else, was the, a period of delight for modelers. You can see the Germans encouraged their pilots to uh, have their own colour schemes. There was generally a pattern to it. The green tail with the red outline indicates Yodstaff or Fighter Unit 5. Um, but apart from that, they, the Germans took the theory that um, the men were going to fight in these things and it helped to know who was who, who was in the other machines, and I built up their morale a little bit to have a nice colourful machine. There's a, another example. Again, an albatross. Green tails again, just a five. Nice aeroplanes, but they weren't really, they were a lighter version of the D3, but they weren't quite as successful. The, the next step was the, the triplane, the pocket deep out, sorry, socket triplane used by the Royal Naval Air Service with three wings. And it was also the favourite mount of uh, a number of Royal Naval Air Service aces, including the Australian Robert Little, who was our, our greatest ace of aces. That's a faked photo of the dogfight, but um, it's, it's claimed to, to show what fight, air fighting really looked like. You can see albatrosses, um, a Bristol fighter down there, an SE 5A. Um, yeah, there weren't that many of these really big fights, but um, when they were on, you could see you had to really have eyes in the back of your head, uh, good reflexes, and a good aeroplane. Unfortunately, the, the, good, the British didn't keep introducing good aeroplanes all the time. This was the next one that um, went to squadron service, replacing DH 2s and Newports. The DH-5, and this is the first mount of uh, number two squadron in Australian Flying Corps. It only had one forward firing gun. Its performance was probably less than that of the Soppet Pup that it was replacing. And it was back staggered. You can see that the lower, the, the upper wing is behind the, the upper wing. This gave the pilot a great view to the front, 
but almost no, no view to the back. Um, so it was used primarily on um, ground strafing. We then come to one of the classic aeroplanes of the war, the Sopwith Camel. Came into service in July 1917, still there for the armistice. By late 1918, it, it was still fighting well, but it was it was too slow. It couldn't accept or decline combat when it wanted to. It was sort of just plugged around. But uh, very manoeuvrable. It um, had a rotary engine, which means that the, the propeller and the engine rotated as a mass, but they rotated together. It was lubricated by castor oil, so if you see any film of a camel or any rotary engine aircraft taking off, there's a mist around it. That's castor oil being sprayed everywhere. Uh, apparently, a, an hour and a half patrol in a, a camel was the equivalent of uh, taking about a spoonful and a half of castor oil, <laughs> which had a, a certain effect on the pilot's digestion. And I gather you, you either became immune to it or um, you become immune to it. <coughs> um, but the camel, it, it also, because of this, it had a rotary engine, uh, it was, the fuselage was only 18 feet long, and in the first nine feet you had the engine, the guns, the ammunition, the fuel, and the pilot. So all the weight was there. Uh, massive torque effect, and it meant that uh, uh, it, it lost height on a right-hand turn and gained on a left-hand turn. But it could turn to the right quicker than it could turn to the left. It was a very manoeuvrable, and in fact it was never actually flying in the direction it was pointing. It was always slightly crabbing to the, to the right, and, and wanting to, to go into it. To, to dive as well, so it took some skill. They say if you could master a camel, uh, you were pretty good. And you, if you knew how to exploit its, its, its features, um, it was a great help. A number of aces flew camels. That's the, uh, the next one, that the, the, the French aircraft, the SPAD 13, which is a two-gun, bigger engine version of their SPAD 7, used by the Americans, the Belgians, the French, Italians. In fact, those of you who drive Ferraris, uh, the um, leaping, the prancing stallion emblem on the Ferrari uh, was the emblem of the top Italian ace of the war, Francesco Baracci. Uh, his family was friends with the, Bra with the Ferrari family, and when Baracci was killed, um, the Ferraris took on his, his emblem as the, um, the badge for their car. Uh, all right, we'll talk <coughs> about the aces. Um, you hear a lot about aces in the, the First World War. Although the term actually wasn't used during the war. If you go through the archives of Flight Magazine, ACE, is, ace as a word, appears only twice, uh, and then to explain what the French mean by the term. But um, it's now sort of been taken as someone who shoots down more than uh, five enemy aeroplanes. This is Albert Ball. He was the first British ace to um, become famous. He, um, he shot down 40, he was credited with 44 enemy aircraft uh, down. Uh, he had the Victoria Cross, the Deutsche Service Officer, the Deutsche Service Order, and the Military Cross, and was killed in action all before his 20th birthday. That's quite a, an achievement. James McCudden, a pre-war regular soldier, worked his way up from, from an aircraftsman to uh, a major, and he was probably the most scientific of the British aces. 57 victories, um, but he, he lightened his aeroplane, he um, improved the performance of the engine, and he would go hunting German two-seaters. He was one of the pilots who realised that bringing down fighter pilots, fighter, did, fighters didn't achieve as much as bringing down two-seaters. The two-seaters were the ones doing the work, the artillery observation or the photographic reconnaissance. And um, yeah, he was a, a great, a good patrol leader, looked after his men, but unfortunately killed in an aircraft accident in 1918. Billy Bishop, a Canadian, and a very controversial figure, uh, he was awarded the Victoria Cross for shooting up a German aerodrome on his own um, so it was the, and bringing down about three German aircraft. Um, after the war, they started examining the German records and the Germans didn't have any record of this um, achievement. He, was, he claimed and was credited with 72 enemy aeroplanes. Many of them um, uh, he encountered on their own while he was out patrolling on his own. And so there were no witnesses. So there's considerable scepticism about, um, about Bishop's uh, performance. Uh, the, the next aeroplane of note that came out was the Fokker triplane. The Germans were very much influenced by the, the Sopwith triplane, and so they built their own version, the Fokker. Two guns, very manoeuvrable, and very popular with that man, Manfred von Richter, the, the Red Baron, though not called that during his time, who's probably the most famous um, 
combatant soldier of the First World War um, that we remember today. Killed in action um, April 1918 when he flew to Tulo over Australian artillery. And this yeah, Bernard Hoss, another German ace, 48 victories. Um, he made a, a point of attacking everything he could um, and, and mainly specialised in attacking fighters. Um, apparently a very good pilot. It took a whole flight of British aces to eventually bring him down and when he was killed in September 1917. Just um, slightly digressing, um, <coughs> just to give you an idea of why did, why did Ben join the Flying Corps when it, was, it wasn't the, uh, the safest thing in the world. That's a photograph of the uh, Belgian village of Passchendaele in December 1916. And this it was captured by the, uh, the Canadians after a, a long battle in November 1917, by which time it looked like that. Um, and on the ground, it looked like that. The Canadians are uh, passionate of. And um, I remember meeting a, a, a First World pilot who was a Mossman resident, actually, about 50 years ago, so I'm showing my age. And uh, I asked him what made you join the Flying Corps. And he said, to avoid the trenches. That's just hard to beat that. Right, back to um, talking about trenches. The Germans went in for specialised aircraft for attacking uh, ground troops. That's a very good one, the Halberstadt CO2. Um, tough, manoeuvrable. You can have a load of bombs. You can see German stick grenades in a holder on the side of the fuselage. So they'd fly at low level, dropping those. And um, they are very good. They specialised in. in Quick ground attack. But also the um, Hanover CL2, the same sort of thing. Tough, manoeuvrable, and reliable. Flying training was something that, um, this is, we've got slightly out of sequence. Flying training was something I was going to talk about. In the early years of the war, the, the farm and shorthorn, like that, was the standard allied uh, saddle British trainer. But uh, it was realised that uh, finally by mid 1917, that uh, the old system where people were training in aeroplanes like that, that were nothing like what they'd fly in, in combat. And the instructors were generally uh, ex pilots on, who'd done a time in France and were back on um, as instructors. <coughs> and it wasn't working, but quite often the, uh, the instructors uh, were men whose nerves were shattered and they just didn't want to fly or didn't want to train. And there are instances of uh, pupils being told, well, get in and fly off. I don't want to help you. Um, and a man called Smith Barry changed the whole thing and um, they, the British adopted the Avro 504 as a standard training aircraft and um, the, the, the means of the, the system of flying training that's in use today and it made a big difference to start sending and they also started training uh, pilots in how to fly, how to fight as well as how to fly before they went to France which cut down the, the casualties quite significantly. Well, but, while we're on the, the UK the, the Germans started bombing um, capital cities using Zeppelins. Now, we, we've seen um, footage of the, uh, the Hindenburg burning at Lake, Lake Constance, New Jersey, and so you tend to think of uh, Zeppelins as being inherently dangerous. However, in up till September 1916, they weren't. They were full of hydrogen. They could climb very rapidly, uh, and the British had no way of knowing when they were coming. Well, they had a way. Uh, the Germans, being methodical, when the Zeppelins were going out on a raid, had to send a signal to base to say they were only carrying a basic code book. Um, and so the British, when well, they intercepted these radio signals, that the whole lot of them were saying, we've only got the basic code book, uh, they knew they were on their way. But this is pre the days of radar, and so detecting these things was just about impossible until they were almost overhead. There were a number of uh, things, were, uh, measures were taken. One of them was building concrete... Um, sort of a concrete cone and very often blind people would sit in the middle of the cone because their hearing was acute to see if they could hear uh, the Zeppelins approaching. Um, it was, yeah, they, the thing with the, the Zeppelin, would, they'd come across the coast at maybe 10, 15,000 feet. Given the aeroplanes today could maybe take you know, 10, 15 minutes to get to that height. Um, and uh, if a, a Zeppelin was approached by a, a a defending aeroplane, drop ballast and it would just go straight up. So um, 
they were a very difficult target until the, the invention of the uh, incendiary ammunition. And that's a B2C, that, that's the actual one that was used to bring down the first German airship. Uh, once the British had invented, uh, perfected incendiary ammunition, you could fire into a Zeppelin and they were fairly easy to bring down. And I've often thought it, uh, what it must have been like to be a Zeppelin crew approaching the British coast and in front of you, you can see one of your other Zeppelins <coughs> going around the flames. And there you are underneath this massive bag of, of hydrogen, or bags of hydrogen. So the Zeppelins were phased out, and the Germans started bombing with, with fixed-wing aeroplanes. These are German Goethe's over London, aiming their off. Um, again, this problem that the, the British had of, of not knowing that they were there, or what they were coming, until they were there, because of this, of course, pre-radar. Um, but the Dutch squadrons were transferred from France. They made life hard, hard for the raiding Goethe's, so they started coming over at night. And uh, in 1918, they were supplemented by the Giants. These are huge aeroplanes. Uh, the wingspan of that thing is about um, uh, 140 odd feet, which makes it, it's got about, uh, they generally had five or six engines. Uh, and one of the aspects of a, a Giant was that uh, it had to, the engines had to be accessible in flight. Because they weren't terribly reliable. So there you can see a gunner and a mechanic um, on a giant on its way across the North Sea. And there's a photograph of the mechanic from a, um, a giant. There's his engine beneath him, and his combat station is to go up that ladder, and then his head pokes up the top of the wing, and he's got a gun on a mount, a machine gun on a mounting up there. And uh, that's where he does, does his job at night. And uh, nothing in. The, uh, the British responded by using good aeroplanes, stuff with camels, uh, as night fighters. And you can see it's been amended from the standard camel because the two Vickers guns that were in front of the pilot uh, weren't very good at night because of a muzzle um, flash that blinded the pilot. So they had Lewis guns moved up to the, the upper wing. And, uh, and they also had a, a mounting where you could fire up at 45 degrees, so if you get underneath a, a giant. One of the problems with the Giants was um, their wingspan was about twice that of, of the Goethe, and the, the sights were generally fixed for, for Goethe's. Um, so at a distance, the, the wingspan of a, uh, a Giant would, would fill the sights, the pilot would fire away, but uh, being a Giant, it was, no, being a, you know, a Giant, it was much further away. So that makes sense. It was, it was hard. <laughs> <laughs> right, things weren't only happening uh, on land. Uh, there was a considerable effort into naval aviation. This is a, a short 184 uh, seaplane carried by a lot of uh, battleships and, and other ships, um, seaplane carriers, and um, did a lot of, of coastal reconnaissance and uh, hunting for U-boats and just all-purpose um, naval aviation. Another one, a Felix Doe F2A. This did a lot of anti-U-boat anti patrols over the North Sea. And the, the hull was painted in a quite a distinctive red and white or blue and white or green and white pattern um, so that if it was forced down at least it was, it was easier to see than um, if it was camouflaged. <coughs> Aircraft were carried on ships. There's a camel on a, um, uh, a cruiser or a battleship. They generally put the, a flying platform above a, a gun turret that steamed into wind, start up the engine and the aeroplane would take off. That, that got it airborne. Getting it down again wasn't as easy. Um, <laughs> the normal thing was that it would land um, in the water and a crane would fix, um, take the aeroplane out and dry off the pilot, or the pilot would get it first, and dry it off, take it back to land, and uh, hopefully use it again. 1918, uh, the with cuckoo, <laughs> so named because it was going to lay its, its eggs in another bird's nest or someone else's nest. Uh, the first dedicated torpedo bomber. Had the war gone on into 1919, the British would have done a, um, a raid on the German fleet at anchor in Kiel Harbour, something like a sort of Pearl Harbour type raid. But the war ended. Right, March 1918, the Kaiserschlacht, the great German offensive, and the Germans produced uh, uh, specialist aeroplanes. One of them, Albatross J1, and these are these J aircraft, they were armoured, so they could cruise about above enemy infantry fairly well. And they, uh, they had two machine guns out angled downwards from the, the lower fuselage. So they could fly along just firing away. So 
not very popular with um, Allied infantry. And the Junkers J1, it's a reconnaissance aircraft, all metal, corrugated skin, very tough, a very good reconnaissance aircraft. If the, the German High Command wanted to know exactly what was happening somewhere, they'd send out one of these. They were, uh, well, as you can see, it's a noble aeroplane. They were nicknamed the, um, the Flying Furniture Van, but none were brought down by enemy aircraft. For high flying aircraft, the Germans used the Rumpler C7, very streamlined aeroplane, uh, oxygen supply for the crew, and that could, they'd, they'd come over the Allied lines at about um, 20,000 feet or even higher and uh, take their photographs and disappear and very often um, unmolested because just took too long for Allied aircraft to get up to, to intercept them. The, then the, the, the next step for the Germans was probably one of the best fighters of the war, the Fokker D7. Uh, Manoeuvrable, tough, um, and uh, with, with that 160 horsepower um, Mercedes engine, it very good performance. Then they fitted a 185 horsepower BMW engine, and it was superb. In fact, it was such a good aeroplane that um, one of the conditions of the armistice in November 1918 was that all Fokker D7s had to be surrendered which is something of a claim to fame. Yeah. On the Allied side, um, the Royal Flying Corps and Royal Naval Air Service were combined into the Royal Air Force, which um, made it a separate service for the first time. And um, better aeroplanes started to appear on the front. This is a French Bruges 14 and the significant thing about this is uh, the markings are American. The Americans had started to arrive on the front, but um, no American designed aircraft flew on the Western Front. They, um, they either bought their airplanes from the Allies or they produced DH-4s with American Liberty engines and um, did their, they, they used them a lot. That's the, the DH-4, as I mentioned, was one of its defects was it used a uh, Rolls-Royce engine which were needed for things like um, the Felix Day flying boats. So there was an attempt to improve the DH-4 by moving the, the two cockpits together, so they weren't set, the pilot observer weren't separated by the fuel tank, um, and they used tried various other engines. This, the most of them, a, a, a BHP 230 horsepower engine, which was a disaster, and um, the numerous attempts with that. They'd go out on bombing raids, and half the aircraft would have to return with engine trouble. But um, in 1919, one of those managed to make it to Australia, so they looked after properly. They could do things. The British also used the Handley Page 0400 night bomber, big aeroplane, and uh, they were used by the Independent Force, Royal Air Force, which was a strategic bombing unit away from the, the British front that was bombing the German industrial area in the, the Ruhr. Had the war gone on into 1919, uh, there would have been an, an inter-allied air force with uh, units from Britain, the US, France and Italy um, engaged in, in strategic bombing, something like they, they did in uh, the Second World War. In the First War, it generally didn't work because the, the payload of the bombers was, was just too light. But the, the idea was there. But <coughs> things were improving on the other side as well. German uh, Siemens Schuchert D4. This is a curious airplane. It's got a rotary engine, a big rotary engine, and a four-blade propeller that rotated in the opposite direction to the, um, to the engine. There's quite a bit of gearing, but it climbed like a lift, and uh, it may well have been the, the best fighter of the war. But fortunately for the Allies, um, it didn't, not too many of them got into squadron service. The FE-2s were, um, found a new lease of life as night bombers. You can see there, there's an FE-2 painted all black, uh, and the observer testing his machine gun in the front. The germ bombing became, night bombing became a big thing. In 1918, the Germans maintained constant um, sort of presence over the German of the Allied lines, sort of nuisance trading. They just bombed railheads, uh, troop concentrations, whatever. That's an AEG, the same people who make uh, electric bomb tools today, um, on an AEG bomber. They were quite a headache. They caused lots of casualties, and uh, if nothing else, they made, meant that no one got to, got to sleep. The Sopwith Dolphin first multi-gun fighter to come into RAF service. It um, performed very well at altitude. It had two Vickers guns and you can see two Lewis guns above the, 
the wing, though these were, were generally removed, they, the pilots found that uh, at altitude it was just too much of an effort to try and reload them. The dolphins did a lot of work at that high altitude, we're talking about sort of 18,000 feet, and uh, one of the real problems the pilots had was this lack of oxygen. Um, it affected their concentration, um, their, their, pa their muscular control, everything else. There was a proposal to fit dolphins with oxygen. In fact, um, there's an account of a, a, a dolphin fuselage being taken to a, an air, airfield. They put an oxygen bottle in it and fired a few machine gun rounds at it, and the oxygen bottle exploded. And the pilots generally decided they had enough problems as things were, they, rather mm -hmm. than having to worry about exploding oxygen as well. Right to the final days of the war, and uh, the DH-9 was improved by the American 400 horsepower Liberty engine. This is a, a marvellous aeroplane. It served in the RAF until about 1930, and uh, but only a squadron of a battle squadron made it to the front before the end of the war. But um, they, were, they were showing the way for the for the future. <coughs> Another aeroplane, the Sopwith Snipe. Lovely aeroplane, the successor to the Camel, but not too many made it to the to the front prior to the, uh, the armistice. But uh, they, were, they were good, and they, but, um, they didn't start, they stayed in RAF service until the mid 1920s. The Sopwith Salamander was a uh, purpose made armoured ground attack aircraft, um, but the war ended before they got to France. The Handley Page V1500, it's a huge aeroplane, sort of the, the British equivalent of the, uh, the Giants. Um, they had a squadron of these about to, to raid Berlin from Britain. Um, and had the, the war gone on another week, they would have done so. But um, uh, when the war ended, there was just, um, they couldn't afford to keep things like this going, so they faded out of RAF service very quickly. The, uh, the Vickers Vini was going to be a, a standard day bomber. Uh, the war ended, one, one went to France before the war ended. But um, in 1919, one flew the Atlantic, and another one was the first aeroplane to fly from Britain to Australia. On the other side of the lines, the, the Germans developed the Fokker D8, which was uh, very manoeuvrable. Um, two guns, uh, probably would have done a lot of damage in 1919, but fortunately that the war ended. The odd, odd thing is that um, they were rather stuck with using a rotary engine, which um, they were being phased out. One of the problems with rotary is they needed this castor oil, and the Germans didn't have castor oil. So they had to use synthetic oil, which wasn't quite as good. But um, nevertheless, the D8 would have been a very potent machine. As with that, the, the Junkers CL1. It's um, all metal, um, two seater, ground attack aircraft, a monoplane, so it's a bit faster than a biplane. Uh, not used on the Western Front, but some were used in the Baltic in 1919. Now we come to Australia's part, and um, I'll just quickly run through this front floor. There's a, um, the first, there was decided in 1913 to establish a flying corps in Australia, um, the same as the British had had, and uh, that's an article from the uh, Melbourne Age of 1913, after they examined and thought about uh, establishing a flying school in Canberra. And um, you'll see that uh, there's the, the, the mention that uh, Lieutenant Petrie, who examined it, they came to the conclusion that the atmosphere was too rarefied and there would be a considerable waste of power in Canberra. <laughs> <laughs> He's actually talking about aeroplanes. But, uh, <laughs> those of us who are public servants will, uh, will recognise that. Right, the first military aeroplanes in Australia were Bristol box kites, they were bought in, um, from Britain, and they trained at uh, Airmen at Point Cook. And so uh, Australia was the only to be the uh, only Empire nation to have its own air service during the war. Uh, Canada was forming the Canadian Air Force um, at the armistice, but um, uh, Australia actually had four squadrons that, that flew. That's the, um, the first aircraft flown by Australians, the, the first half flight that went to Mesopotamia. Um, Australia provided the, the men, and the Indian government provided the aeroplanes. It's a, 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 a French war zone. Uh, we had one squadron in uh, Palestine, a lot of them flew the BE-12, which was a, a not very successful attempt to make a fighter out of the BE-2. Um, it worked all right-ish, 
in Palestine, where the opposition wasn't up to much, but it was, was a disaster on the Western Front. They then standardised on the, um, in 1918, on the Bristol Fighter, um, which did a very good work in, on the Western Front and did good work in Palestine as well. And these, that's a colour photograph of Australian Flying Corps aircraft um, in Palestine. Number two squadron AFC was originally issued with the uh, the DH five, which is a um, we, we've discussed before the rearward uh, sloping um, struts. Uh, good ground attack aircraft. They did a lot of work at the Battle of Cambrai in ground support in, of, of the tanks, but uh, in essence they're a pretty awful machine. And they were, number two squadron was re-equipped with the SE five A, and that's number two squadron's SEs in France. Number three squadron through the RE8, and the in fact there's an RE8. One of their RE8s was the British aeroplane that, that logged the most combat hours of the war, so like 445. And um, curiously, there's an RE8 crew were involved in a, a strange incident. Uh, they were attacked by a German albatross, and um, they managed to put a, a bullet through the, the fuel tank of the albatross, and he, and he landed. Uh, it was forced to land and the pilot was captured, and the Albatross is now on display in the War Memorial in Canberra. But uh, at the same time, the um, Albatross pilot managed to, to shoot uh, at the RE 8, and one bullet went through both the pilot and the observer, killing them both. But the aeroplane kept flying uh, in sort of ever increasing circles and ended up um, sort of forced landing in a field about 50 kilometres away. So, uh, yeah, they're a stable aeroplane. Number four squadron uh, flew up with camels. You can see that the um, boomerang marking on them, which uh, they kept that until March 1918. Then um, they were all, all squadron markings were changed then because the Germans had worked out who was who. They were then re-equipped with a sop with snipe and did very well with the, with the snipe. Though in fact it was quite a testament that when the snipe was replacing the camel that uh, number four squadron was chosen to uh, as one of the first squadrons to receive snipes. That's um, the Royal Flying Corps, the Royal Australian Flying Corps, uh, had two bases in Britain and um, where they trained pilots. That's, that's one of them, that's Mitch and Hampton, where we had two squadrons and two squadrons elsewhere. Uh, that's a photograph of um, the Lieutenant McNamara, VC, Australia's only VC in the, the Australian Flying Corps' only VC at the war. And he's about to take off from Victoria in the first combat sortie from an Australian base. They're out looking for the German raider Wolf that was um, out in the Southern Ocean. Didn't find it. Australia's uh, leading ace, Harry Cobby, with uh, 29 victories. Australian Flying Corps' leading ace, Harry Cobby, 29 victories. Um, survived the war, came back, uh, served in the Second World War as well, and was regional director of the uh, New South Wales Region of the Department of Civil Aviation. That's Australia's greatest ace, who served in the Royal Naval Air Service, Robert Little. He, um, 47 victories, um, apparently a very good pilot, very popular man, but unfortunately killed in action in a, um, attacking a, a Goethe at night. So, and that's, yeah, for some reason, this, these got out of sequence. When we're talking about, camp, about um, observation, that's a rather poor photograph, but it shows something that had to be done on roads in the Western Front. You can see there's a Hessian screen along the side of the road to, to mask it from um, balloon observation so that the, the Germans couldn't see if, if there was transport on the road or not. 